Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today, we thank you for taking your time to watch Stay Curious. Our hearts are broken on this Valentine's Day with the loss of our friend, Mr. Hugh Harris. Um, and Marty Winkle, our cameraman co-producer here is with me. We have had Hugh on this program for exactly a year. Hugh passed away in his sleep last night at the age of 90. For exactly one year, Mr. Harris has been providing a once a month episode on Stay Curious about his insight into America's space program. And when he was on our show for the last time, January 11th, he was never sharper. So we're going to have some tributes to Hugh today. I talked to his son, Tom, in Chicago, uh, who wanted to break the news to the American Space Museum. Um, Marty, I got uh, pictures out of line there as we look at our Valentine's. Don't have... There's the first uh, time that we met Hugh. Uh, first time I met Hugh with masks on uh, in the midst of the COVID pandemic. That was about May 2020 in there and uh, doing our old school uh, barrier between us there and so forth. Our COVID barrier. There's the picture of him during his retirement, about his retirement age. Uh, uh, we'll, we might do more about Hugh. He was called the voice of NASA for many years by the world's television networks. Uh, he devoted 35 years with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration telling the story of the United States space program. And although he's best known for his public calmness of doing the countdowns for the space shuttle, his primary accomplishments were in directing an outreach program to the general public, news media, students, educators, as well as business and government leaders. And uh, he was the third director of public affairs for NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Um, and um, though he received a lot of individual awards, he was particularly pleased with the team awards that were made by his uh, department, the public affairs department there of Kennedy Space Center. And we all know how important that job was, announcing to the world the triumphs and the tragedies of America's space age. Uh, Hugh began his career as a member uh, in uh, news media in uh, Morristown, New Jersey as a reporter. He's born in Ohio, the Cleveland area. Uh, he worked for the Cleveland uh, uh, newspapers around there. And uh, he, he, was, he was on many committees and boards and so forth in his career. He, he leaves a wife, uh, two sons, a daughter, uh, many grandchildren and great-grandchildren on there. And it's been hard to really sink in a little bit for me because we, Hugh and I, become great friends. You all know that I'm a journalist and um, we had a lot of fun stories about that. We feel like we reinvigorate our national treasures like Hugh when we have them on our program, give them a purpose that uh, we want to hear their stories again. And, and understand what uh, their perspective on space history. Some of the tributes coming in on our post on Facebook I uh, would like to share with you um, uh, with uh, Dr. Al Kohler, uh, who is uh, one of the main forces of our museum for decades. Uh, he was hired as just a teenager out there at Kennedy Space Center. Dr. Al says, this one is really tough. He was a true friend to just about everyone. His memories let him share with us experiences that few of us could match. Thank you, Mr. Kohler, for saying those words. I talked to Bob Seek, the launch director of over uh, 37 shuttle missions. I think over 50 missions for Bob. He said uh, specifically about the, during the Challenger disaster that Hugh had the weight of the world on him during the Challenger disaster, and he handled it like no other person could. Uh, he was the assistant to Chuck Holland's shed of, uh, over the Public Affairs Division during Challenger. And Bob said, with the news media clamoring for the scoop on the cause and astronaut recovery, Hugh was the calming force under all that pressure. Words from Mr. Bob Seek. 
Um, and looking at some of the comments on our Facebook uh, friends on the post there, Jonathan Ward, uh, had the author of Bringing Columbia Home with Mike Leinbach and two other books about the Rocket Ranch uh, and a book on Eileen Collins. Jonathan Ward said, oh, my heart is so heavy. What a wonderful man he was, so ready to help and encourage, so willing to listen to and be interested in what other people had to say, and so profound in his own observations from being in the middle of it all. Godspeed, Hugh. Those words from Jonathan Ward. Uh, Tom Musiak, our launch photographer friend, said, I'm glad I'm glad I got to reconnect with Hugh through the museum this past year. He was a true professional. And um, Dave Stange, one of our number one friends out there, who, like me, gotten to know Hugh Harris through our program here. Dave sums it up that I always enjoyed hearing his stories. Thank you for having him on the show so we could learn from the past. A great man who will definitely be missed. And uh, Sharon Shrew Lazada says, Hugh was always one of my favorite NASA KSC managers. May he rest in peace. We lost a great man and a large piece of NASA history. In <clears throat> uh, these words from Tom uh, Tagli Taglienti, he lives in Tampa. Uh, Tom, uh, obviously a space worker. He said this, quote, His voice will always echo across the Kennedy Space Center grounds. We will hear him in the wind as it swells up across the canyons of the buildings and the rocket garden at the visitors complex the men and women pulling us into our future on the rockets of tomorrow will hear hugh's voice in the clouds as they pass through the, the speed of sound hugh's memory will remain here with us even though he could not he made the shuttle pre-launch activity so much fun and educational hugh really do his stuff god give rest to this exceptional gentleman and uh, great words from you tom uh tagliente uh, and all this is hard for me to read all this uh, uh just getting to know him in the last year uh he took such interest in what the museum was doing and uh was so so well behind uh, what we're trying to do in the future <clears throat> by highlighting the shuttle era, which he, of course, is the uh, one of the faces of. Uh, and here from Adele uh, Bertie. Adele Bertie had this to say. Uh, an exceptional story here, Adele. I was fortunate to have met Hugh Harris as a teenager caught in the foster care system. He was incredibly kind and generous to my mother and myself during a rough time and helped me get on my feet when I was emancipated at age 17. The voice of NASA was also a tender-hearted man who cared for people less fortunate. It was always there to help. I'm still taking in this loss. Rest in starlight, dear Hugh. That from your friend Adele Bertie. So, um, When we lose people like this, and we're going to lose a lot of them that around here at this museum, it just reemphasizes for me the importance that they were to our country in this really <laughs> kind of strange, different world of our America space program where friends like my, my buddy Marty uh, Winkle here, uh, you know, helped us land on the moon and then helped us build the, the International Space Station. And along the way, you've got people like Hugh that, that, that told the story so eloquently. And uh, we are going to miss him a lot. And uh, we have a lot of plans to uh, write things about some of the journalists on there. And I know that Hugh uh, is right, has been writing his memoirs and so forth. And uh, we just want to keep his family uh, in, in our minds in this fresh... Uh, news of the day that we lost one, one of NASA's true legends today at age 90, uh, Mr. Hugh Harris. <clears throat> so, compose myself a little bit on this uh, uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, after all, we should celebrate a man or woman that lives into their 90s 
and and right to the end i told uh, bob seek i said he went down swinging bob and you need to do the same thing uh by sharing your stories to the bitter end there and you certainly did and and uh we we enjoyed him so much and he meant a lot to this museum but beyond the, the the past year that we've had him on stay curious so well we do want to think about valentine's day and and our hearts are broke for hugh but but our love will always endure and let's look at it that way um uh a little bit of space history we, we love our our little uh this always reminds me and, and you too i'm sure of elementary school who could get the most valentines and and would the the cutest girl in the class give me one? Uh, so uh, so uh, we we think about that on today's day of love, and uh, there's a lot of hearts in the in the in the universe, uh, in the form of uh, nebula and galaxies, and lots of hearts are on the planet Mars, the red planet Mars. Here's a, a nine or ten heart shaped craters uh, that are on the planet Mars. And uh, very fun to look at those. More hearts on Mars there uh, against the ruddiness of the red there. Uh, what causes these features to be a, a heart? Well, it's a lot of it's erosion and just circumstances of the impacts hitting them there. And how about a beautiful necklace to give your, your lover from the sky up there on Valentine's Day? And of course, Pluto uh, has a... Uh, when we were blown away to see Pluto, this is actually a slushy nitrogen lake, all right, called uh, uh, Tombaugh, after Clyde Tombaugh that discovered the planet Pluto. And yes, it is a planet, a dwarf planet, but I will always think of Pluto as one of the nine planets. And there's a ring in the sky to get engaged with, the ring nebula up there. So all kinds of things in the sky. Uh, to remind us of Valentine's Day. But um, what I thought I would do today, and kind of appropriate with the, the losing hue, to look up at the stars and think of them in a different way, and that is a little soliloquy uh, about uh, the romance of the stars being lost in the stars. And um, so the romance of the skies is almost lost in today's modern world as it's hard to put stars in your lover's eyes from any backyard because of the light pollution. Uh, I'm not talking about the horoscope kind of stars. I'm talking about the canopy of twinkling stars that we see from swaying on a backyard swing, for example. Light pollution has robbed us of backyards of star, our backyards of starlight, and technology has virtually brought our world completely inside. I don't have to tell you about the comfy confines of our home and watching TV, personal computers, our smartphones uh, for the latest things going on. You can even have a telescope outside and it beaming to you Bluetooth on your smart tablet what it's looking at. But I'm talking about whatever happened to like the song Stardust or how about the song When You Wish Upon a Star and other great songs influenced by those twinkling orbs. When people hear that I'm a stargazer, I'm sometimes taken aback that they think I'm a know everything about the Hollywood uh, stars and starlets there of our movies. Well, no, I'm not that kind of stargazer. But the point is, twinkling lights that used to dazzle our senses and provoke amorous thoughts in music and literature are really all but forgotten. When was the last time you wondered about a twinkling star in your backyard or made a wish upon a shooting star, for that matter? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Well, that familiar melody is from an 18th century French children's rhyme, with the original lyrics are really about a kind of candy. John Sebastian Bach supposedly played the tune himself. But the lyrics we're familiar with go back to 1806 and were written by a woman named Jane Taylor. <clears throat> now, every baby boomer out there knows Jiminy Cricket, I should hope, from the wonderful world of Disney that we watched every Sunday night at 
seven o'clock, and then at eight o'clock was Ed Sullivan. Uh, well, many of us can probably even sing Wouldn't You Wish Upon a Star by Jiminy Cricket. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing for you here. Uh, but that cutesy insect was a regular on the wonderful world of Disney. And for years, he opened up the show with When You Wish Upon a Star uh, Makes No Different Who You Are. Uh, but Jiminy introduced that song in the 1940 animated feature Pinocchio, in which, written by Ned Washington and Lee Hairline. The Academy, American Film Academy, ranks When You Wish Upon a Star as the seventh in the top 100 film songs of all time. And that's Disney's highest ranked song, believe it or not. Um, and the lyrics go something like, When you wish upon a star makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. And, uh, and like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams can come true. So think about that on this valentine's dinner you're going to have tonight oh sure you can buy your lover a piece of fancy paper with a star map on it and 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 point to an alien sun that's named after them okay or you can even buy a bunch of impressive documents and photos that say you own a piece of the moon just plop down 30 bucks but does that really say i love you most of us can't go outside and see the sparkling arm of the milky way because it's just too much light pollution. The suburbs have too many unshielded lights, and they've robbed us of the night. If you're lucky enough to live in the country, where a lake or mountain or out on the beach away from city lights, then starlight can get in your eyes. And I implore you to step outside. Wrap your eyes around this universe around you, okay? Hunters and wildlife enthusiasts know the feeling of nature taking you by the senses. You got to experience it for more than just 10 or 15 minutes. You really need to camp out in your own backyard under the stars or wherever you're at and absorb the night light. See that meteor passing by. Make a wish upon a star. First next star I start meteor I see though, I'm going to be wishing my friend Hugh Harris an eternity of happiness on that star. And when we look at the starry night unfiltered by artificial light, the sight can truly be overwhelming. Many bright stars in the wintertime on cool, crisp nights are glittering like diamonds for you out there. And if you look long enough at these points of light, they can actually warm your soul as it simmers with the why and the wherefore. Is anybody looking back? Is this a, 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 a time and place? that that uh, in our universe in the milky way here is it talking to me in some way these are truly inspiring thoughts to have and and as, as well as the romantic thoughts of putting stars in your lover's eyes are there other universe uh, solar systems looking back at us we've already discovered 5000 exoplanets orbiting some of the 500 nearest stars which ones have life all right. Just look at the starry nights and how they inspired and even tormented artists like Vincent Van Gogh. And don't forget the poets who wove starlight into their amorous dreams like Oliver Wendell Holmes. Over and here's an a, a poem by M, uh, Amelia Welby of 19 of 1890s. All right. A poem 130 years old. Starlight at sea, overhead the countless stars like eyes of love were beaming. Underneath the weary earth, all breathless lay a-dreaming. The twilight hours like birds flew by, as lightly and as free. Ten thousand stars were in the sky, ten thousand were in the sea. For every wave with dimpled face that leapt upon the air had caught a star in its embrace and held it trembling there. What an image that is of seeing starlight over a calm ocean or, or on a lake or just sitting like this person taking in the cosmos. Rare are these isolated times when you and the beckoning starry light seem to be alone 
and lost. But if captured, it can be an amazing experience for all your senses. So I implore you to go out on a dark, cold February night and get yourself warm by the blackness that's punctuated by starry pinpoints in our spiritual dimension. It seems when you do this and really enjoy and bathe in the starlight, the inner workings of our human psyche take over. Suddenly, a star-filled night has intimacy. And again, a streaking meteor can can just enhance that experience with the why, where did that come from? The romance of the stars may be losing its grip on the hearts of today's lovers, but you can recapture that magic any clear night. Just lay underneath the cosmos, open your eyes, and let your heart and mind feel its energy. Just be bold enough the next clear, cold night to venture outside for an hour or so and embrace the night like never before and see if something stirs within, something that makes you wonder about those twinkling stars. I end today's program with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow from 1870s. Marty, what are our friends saying out there to us today? You're... Uh, a lot. <laughs> um, I, I wrote one of them down from Lisa Malone, uh -huh. who worked for you. Absolutely. Yeah, Is give there... me Lisa's comment there. Yeah. Or actually, I could, I could look it up on my phone here myself. Lisa, I know your heart's heavy today uh, with this great man. And uh, let, me, let me see if I can pull it up there real quick uh, on my uh, there. Uh, okay, there we go. Let's see. And um, like I said, a time to celebrate uh, a, a, a time that we're all going to meet the uh, meet our maker there. What'd you write there, Marty? Well, I'm trying to pull that oh, up. It's right there, Mark. Oh, OK. Uh, Lisa uh, uh, Malone, who, who was a protege of uh, Hugh Harris, says words cannot express the grief I feel in hearing this news about the loss of my first boss and my hero. He was kind, generous, intelligent, full of compassion for others and so many other excellent qualities. I feel more than fortunate to have had the chance to learn so much from him. And that's from Lisa Ann Malone, uh, who I had the privilege to meet at the astronaut uh, memorial, not an astronaut memorial, the, ast the, the luncheons that Hugh has um, uh, conducted for a long time. And... Uh, yeah, I can't see those as they uh, are coming up there, Marty. But uh, we'll reprise some of your thoughts up there of our dear departed Mr. Hugh Harris, 90 years old. Uh, and uh, Lisa Malone, thank you for sharing there today. Marty, anything else there? We'll... Yeah, but I can't read them like you can, Mark. So okay, it, it's, it's all online here. All right. Well, lots of great tributes there. Uh, again, I can't see them. Uh, until we air the, uh, uh, I see him as the show goes along. No, there, no, there we go. Uh, Chris Kelly, so very sorry to hear about you. Uh, uh, we'll reprise some of your thoughts up there. And uh, dear departed Mr. Hugh Harris. Thank there's uh, Cliff Watson, uh, Tom Celentano, uh, uh, and Tom Celentano. Lisa remembers you calling many launches there. Uh, and uh, Hugh was willing to share the spotlight. He didn't want that single point failure. And just, uh, I, I just personally really feel robbed that we weren't able to execute some of the things that we were planning to do with this, this wonderful man. And uh, so uh, uh, keep his family. Uh, I talked to his son, Tom, uh, today, and uh, uh, the family will be getting together on there, uh, we know that our hearts are aching. Doug Forrest, Gary Gerald, Melissa Pope, uh, Hazel Banks, thank you for your note. Hazel, Cynthia Rossi, Steve Hammer. Uh, we've mentioned Tom and Mark Usiak and Dr. Al Kohler. Uh, Bill Whiting, head back to Michigan. Robert Martin, Cliff Watson, thank you for 400 stars. Carlton Bailey watching. Dave Stange, uh, Chris Kelly, uh, Fox McLeod. Uh, and uh, so many of you out there, thank you for participating. 
And uh, to end this program, let's look at something beautiful, uh, a beautiful poem by the classic poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1870s, okay, right after the Civil War. He wrote this. I heard the trailing garments of the night sweep through her marble halls. I saw her sable skirts all fringed with light from the celestial walls. I felt her presence by its spell of might stoop over me from above, the calm, majestic presence of the night as of the one I love. So thank you all for taking part and stay curious today. Uh, just want to simply say, Hugh Harris, we love you. We're going to miss you. And we hope to see you as we all bridge the space between us. Thank you.